here today. This is going to be an exciting worship service. I'm Richard Wesley, the pastor here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And today we are looking at a story out of Mark's gospel. It, it actually touches last Sunday's story and continues it. We're looking at discipleship today. And, and our, our theme is really a question. Will you follow Jesus? After what you learned today, if you're already a follower of Jesus, are you willing to continue? Will you follow Jesus? Now, I've got an exciting announcement for you. This, today's the day that we are going to uh, receive our scout report. We have uh, Jeff Walter here with us. Jeff is the uh, Cub Master for PAC 505 that we hold the charter for at St. Bethlehem. He's also the Assistant Scout Master of PAC 289. Now, when we're blessed to be in person worship, the scouts are here, the flags are here, the parents are here. It's just one of the most exciting days of our year. But this is one of those years when everything's different. But I am excited to receive the report of the scouts. And so I introduce to you at this time, Jeff. Jeff. Hello, as introduced, I'm Jeff Walter. I'm the Cub Master of your PAC 505. I'm not gonna sugarcoat how things have been for scouting. This last year has been challenging. Membership in scouts and other youth-based programs across the nation has suffered in the shadow of the COVID pandemic. That should come as no surprise to anyone. It has been tough for all of us. But as scouts, when a problem challenge or challenge arises, as the Scout Oath says, do our best. We do our best for our families, our pack, and our community. Since my last update a year ago, just before the pandemic hit, PAC 505 has tried its best to stay alive and active. By utilizing programs like Camp in a Box, remote scavenger hunts and trail hikes, Zoom meetings, as well as other activities, we have done everything we could to keep the pack going and our scouts doing. Over the summer, we had a change of administration. Our committee chair, Joshua Hill of three years, handed the reins over to our new committee chair, Christina Feller. At the beginning of the school year, the damage was apparent. Our numbers, like every other scout unit, had dropped. What remained was a core group of dedicated scouts and parents who understood the true value of scouting and the scout program, what it provides to our children and our community. So we pushed on. In August, we awarded past due awards as well as summertime activity awards, and we kicked off the new school year. Our dens began meeting in homes and at parks, doing everything to ensure the safety of our scouts and their families while trying to remain productive. District offered programs as well, like the, Scout, like the Cub Scouts Shooting Day and giving more opportunities to scouts in the area. In December, we crossed over three arrow of lights to Troop 289 and to Troop 21. In order to give the next portion of this report, I actually have to backtrack to November. The Cub Master, PAC 516, reached out to me. They were facing a unique and concerning issue. His son was crossing over in February, and no one was able to step forward to take over his position. In addition, the PAC was informed that they were not going to be rechartered. He asked me if PAC 505 would be willing to take his scouts in. I did not hesitate with an emphatic yes. I caught him off guard. I explained to him that my first concern will always be and will be the scouts and ensuring they have a place to call home. They needed a new place to scout, so we opened our arms to them and welcomed all of them. In the following weeks, to allow myself to get, them, to get to know them and their families better, I attended their PAC meetings. 
or den meetings to get them, let them get into my face and I theirs. Time went by and February arrived. Recharter month for both of our units. On the 13th, we held a joint crossover, Blue and Gold and Pinewood Derby, an event I dubbed Cool Runnings because of the nature of the weather we were experiencing. It was very cold. It was an outdoor event, might I add. Both packs brought their cars, some tuned in in person and some tuned in via Zoom to witness the festivities. Everyone had a blast as we celebrated scouting and the union of the two packs. We crossed over their arrow of lights, issued awards, and derby placements. We recognized the hard work their leaders performed and thanked their Cub Master for all he had done for Pack 516. At the end of the event, we left a unified single unit. Through our union, Pack 505 is now the oldest pack in Clarksville, Tennessee. We remain standing among so many packs that have folded. We remain dedicated to scouting and providing the best program to all scouts, boy or girl, regardless of when they come to us. We continue to emphasize training and safety to ensure the utmost protection possible to our scouts. We thank the parish of St. United Methodist Church for your past, present, and continued support through these trying times and beyond. Thank you.
gospel lesson this morning is found in the book of Mark. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take, the, take up the cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Welcome to the second Sunday in Lent. I trust that you are experiencing a holy Lent, a journey of growing in your faith. You may recall last Sunday we looked at the wilderness experience. We watched as God's loving Holy Spirit thrust Jesus into a 40-day experience where the wild things are. We acknowledged that all of us go through wilderness journeys. We ask if God ever forces us into the wilderness. When we think about the wilderness journey, I think it's only right to acknowledge that you don't have to be a follower or a disciple of Jesus to experience life struggles. Life is challenging for all of us, especially in an out of control pandemic and a resurgence of open racism. All of us have a chance to learn and grow from the struggles we face. Learning from our challenges is not unique to Christianity. It isn't even unique to religion. However, in today's story, Jesus points out what will be different if you decide to follow him. There is a cost to being a disciple of Jesus. Now, by the time Mark's gospel gets to today's story, in those chapters, Jesus has already called, trained, sent, and evaluated his disciples. They have been with him in times of exciting ministry success, and they have been firsthand witnesses of controversy, strife, and even danger. These followers have witnessed healings, exorcisms, and two mass feedings of thousands of people. But today, the journey becomes real. Today is a day for Jesus' followers, both then and today, to ask the serious question, will I follow Jesus? Today is a day for us to ask and answer for ourselves, will we, will I, will you follow Jesus? You know, Jesus is a fun guy. He parties with the people on society's edge, making the religious people crazy. They point fingers at Jesus and say, we've never lived our faith like that. You're not one of us. And sometimes it's fun to stir the pot and watch the legalist folks squirm. But today, the journey gets real. Today, Jesus lays out some heavy teaching. Today, 
Jesus talks about his expectations using terminology he has never used with his followers prior to this event. Today, things get real. Our story says, Then Jesus began to teach them that he must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. He said all this quite openly. It's Mark's way of saying this was well understood. They might not like it, but they understood what Jesus was saying. They might not even believe it, but they didn't miss what Jesus meant. Now, Peter gets a lot of criticism, especially in today's story, for what he does next. Because Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Mark reveals something about Peter's character that we sometimes miss. Peter has the maturity to take Jesus aside before trying to correct him. To rebuke is to inform someone of their error. Have you ever been corrected or challenged in front of others? I bet you have. I have. You know, the Pharisees used that technique. The Pharisees frequently challenged Jesus in front of a crowd. This public challenge, both then and today, is a way to say, look at me, I'm the important one here. But Peter doesn't try to score points with others. Peter is genuinely concerned about the mission at hand. He does not yet fully understand the mission, certainly doesn't fully understand its implications. But Peter is genuinely concerned about the success of what Jesus has started. So, Peter takes Jesus aside privately to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, an interesting phrase, Turning and looking at the others, he comes back and speaks to Peter because he knows that the disciples have the same feelings that Peter has. They're just not willing to talk to Jesus about it. Have you ever had acquaintances like that? They, they wouldn't talk to you about what they thought was a problem. Peter was not that person. So turning and looking at the disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. You are setting your mind on human things when you should be setting your mind on the things of God. Could Jesus be serious here? Jesus just called Peter the Satan. And the reason Jesus gives for calling Peter the Satan is that Peter is thinking and acting and making decisions out of a human mindset. Jesus says something that doesn't fit Peter's cultural expectation. And rather than trying to learn what Jesus means, Peter corrects Jesus to bring Jesus in line with Peter's own cultural expectations. You see, in Jesus' day, Messianic Jews expected a military solution to the Roman problem. A Messiah in the role of King David would lead Israel to a military victory over the Roman Empire. That was the cultural expectation. Peter had his mind made up on how this was going to turn out. Now Jesus was saying things that contradicted his cultural world view. You know, we know a few things about having our world views upset. 
We are living in a time and culture that no one expected in lots of different ways. I mean, as recently as the 1960s, people were expected to attend a Christian church in America. And they were expected to attend every Sunday. In fact, in the 1960s, if a man did not attend church on any given Sunday, it was not unusual for his boss to ask him where he was and why he wasn't in church. And he might want to give a good answer because his job could be in danger if his answer wasn't good enough. You see, the culture of America in the 60s equated a person's morals with church attendance. And if a man didn't attend church, he must not have good morals. And if he doesn't have good morals, well, are we sure we want that kind of person working for us? Oh, and by the way, yes, I do mean men. You see, that culture expected women to stay home. <coughs> The workplace was for men. The home was for women. That was that culture. We no longer live in that culture. Today, if your boss asks you why you were not in church Sunday, he better be asking out of a friendship because church attendance is no longer required to keep your job. As recently as 1963, major newspapers such as the New York Times still listed daily Bible reading guides in the newspaper. You know, some of you younger than me, you'll have a hard time wrapping your mind around that. But many of these guides in the daily newspaper followed the lectionary cycle that the church follows to preach from. We no longer live in that culture, but we still try to do church as though we live in that culture continuing to run our churches with the same operational procedures that we created in the 1950s has resulted in a rapid decline in church attendance all across our nation for all denominations. But, like Peter, we have our minds set on human things, and we want our way. Our way. Let's talk about our way. Right after calling Peter the Satan for wanting things to remain the way the culture thought they should be, Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves, let them deny our way, and take up their cross and follow me. Let them deny our way and take up their cross and follow me. There is a cost to following Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, I don't like this illustration that Jesus gave the disciples then and there. I would be more comfortable with Jesus saying that I'll suffer if I follow him or that I'll struggle if I cast my lot in with him. But I don't like the illustration Jesus uses. Remember, the cross in Jesus' day is a political invention. To talk about the cross is a political conversation. The cross was invented by the Romans to be a torturous form of legalized murder for the political enemies of the Roman Empire or the Roman Emperor. Rome did not crucify anyone who was not considered a political enemy of the government. And Jesus dares to tell the crowds and his followers that the cost of following him would be that each follower, pay attention here, it's just as true for us today, that each follower would live in such a way as to be political enemies of the government of their day. We tend to use humor to ease our uneasiness here. I do. 
Have you ever heard anyone say, well, you know, it's just my cross to bear? I've done it. Maybe you have too. But what does it mean to take up your cross and follow Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus? Do you have your cross to bear? What is your cross? Yeah, look, I don't understand how anyone can have a cross and not know what it is. Think Jesus and crucifixion here. After all, the cross was the cruelest form of torturous murder that Rome could devise. You would know it if you experienced it. Today in our politically charged culture, your cross might be actively loving and caring for someone across the political divide. And if you do that, you'll know it. It probably includes wearing a mask and social distancing to not only stay safe and help others keep safe, but to also visibly show your compassion in the middle of an out of control pandemic. Today, second Sunday in Lent, is the day to ask, will I follow Jesus? Knowing what I know now about what Jesus just said, am I willing to continue following Jesus or if I'm not a follower, am I willing to cast my lot in with those expectations? Let us pray. Everlasting God, you do not hide your face from those who call upon you. We lift our praise in the midst of the congregation. As a part of the families of nations of the earth, we worship your holy name. You declared a covenant with Abraham that has, was offered to all who would call upon your name. You promised us an everlasting heritage in calling us to walk before you blamelessly. But we have not been blameless. We have not been fruitful in our works. We have denied your truth and have failed to take up our cross in obedience to your word. We know the law brings wrath, but and your mercy is life. Give us your mercy and forgive us, O oh Lord. You have entrusted us with the task of calling all the earth to remember and turn to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may proclaim your deliverance even to a people yet unborn and to tell of your mercy to the, uh, the upcoming generations. Jesus taught us that we must suffer, that he must suffer many things. He must be rejected and die, that your salvation might be one. Today, many suffer from illness of the body. We know of those who are rejected because of trouble in their minds. This day, some will die. Comfort all those whom we lift up before you and deliver them. We pray this in the name of him who will come in glory, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
So today, we're asking the question, will you follow Jesus? You know, I cannot imagine not being a follower of Jesus. I can't imagine not loving Jesus. I can't wrap my mind around not longing to live the life that Jesus calls me to live. With all of its challenges, I can't imagine not being a disciple of Jesus. But today we're asking that question. Will you follow Jesus? You know, being a disciple and following Jesus is is built into our baptismal vows. It grows out of our baptismal vows, if you will. Let me just remind you this morning of our vows of membership. We began, when you joined the church, we began, we asked you as members of Christ's universal church. Now, think about this. We're acknowledging that you're already a member of, of something much bigger than the United Methodist Church. You're a member of, of the church universal of all times, all ages, all places. And so we ask you, as a member of Christ's universal church, will you now be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? When you joined the United Methodist Church, you said, I will live my life in such a way that the mission of growing disciples for Jesus, for the transformation of our community, is something that I will live into. It's something that I will give all of my strength to do. That's your vow. That's what you promised. Secondly, we ask as members of this local congregation, now we're going from the United Methodist Church to St. Bethlehem, United Methodist Church. You see what we did in here? We started with Christ's Universal Church. Then we talked about being a member of the United Methodist Church. And then we talk about as members of the St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your minister, uh, witness, and your witness. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness. And you said, I vow that that's the life I will live. What a commitment. You have vowed to pray for me, for, for Robert and, and, and for uh, uh, Margaret and, and for Michaela and for all of the members and staff of, of our church, our local community of faith. You have vowed to be present, to be here. Now, you can't be here in body, in person worship right now. That's why you're here right now on YouTube. That's why you're in those Zoom rooms because you made a vow before the church, before the congregation, and before God, that you would be present. You made a vow that you would serve with your gifts, that part of your income would go back to providing for the outreach that the local church does, and St. Bethlehem does a lot. You vowed to, to uh, serve with your service, so not just your financial gifts, but your spiritual gifts that you would utilize those to help strengthen and grow St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And with your witness, you said, I will live a life so when people look at me, they will know that I'm different. They'll wonder why I love people who try to harm me. It's because that's my witness for Jesus Christ. There's a cost to discipleship. It grows out of our backs. So I leave you this second Sunday and then with the question, knowing all that you know, will you follow Jesus?